Guten Abend. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jörg Schumacher from the Goethe Institute. It's a pleasure to see you tonight for the lecture of Andreas Reckwitz here at the Goethe Institute. I'm very happy to welcome you to this event, which is a partner project together with Villa Aurora, Thomas Mannhaus. You learn later, it's like where the connection to Villa Aurora and Thomas Mannhaus um, uh, derives from, it's like a, but there is like a beautiful connection actually. Uh, and 1014 Space for Ideas on the Upper East Side uh, and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Let me give you a quick, uh, some quick information on our housekeeping and then uh, I'll ask Stefan Altevogt and Benjamin Wagner to join me on stage before we start with the evening program. I would like to introduce you to our COVID policy, which actually is, I ask you to have the masks on in the audience, a second like afterwards, a second like at the reception if you decide to stay, Uh, at the um, at the reception, a sec, there will be uh, open drinks, a second there will be food, a sec, but in the library we still have um, a mask policy and uh, thank you very much for for following. Um, second thing I would like to introduce you is the books of Andreas Reckwitz. It's like uh, there is two books translated into English by Polity. You'll find them in our library. This is a circulation desk library We have 7,000 media from Germany and about Germany uh, in German and in English. The books of Andreas Reckwitz you'll find here in English. And the Goethe Institute is um, uh, cooperating, is like, uh, supporting um, uh, American publishers with the translation support. So we were very happy like, to support the translation of these two books with Polity Press. And Polity Press is happy to offer a discount code for the books in case you would like to buy them. Uh, the discount code you'll find on the on the library desks that can read it out it's 20 r e c in capital letters that's the discount code for the book i'm also happy to introduce you to the flow of show we will have paul cotman and i'm delighted to say like, that we have him here is like to introduce us to andre andreas reckwitz uh, and moderate the discussion um, after uh, andreas um, uh, lecture and it will be followed by um, a reception afterwards Without further ado, I'll ask my colleagues Stefan Altefugt and Benjamin Wagner on stage, and uh, they'll hand it over to Dean Whiteside, my colleague from the library, for the introduction. Hello, uh, thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm uh, Stefan Altefugt from the German Research Foundation, DFG. We are an organization that spends about three and a half billion dollars Uh, annually for better the research enterprise in Germany. We do it in a competitive way. So decisions are being made by a jury comprised of scientists. So, and one of our, uh, yeah, the, the one of our uh, program lines are, are prizes and Andreas Reichwitt was awarded a Leibniz prize. It's been awarded uh, for the last 20 years, uh, 10 per year, it comes with, uh, the price is about two and a half million euros. So it gives the researcher awarded with it a lot of freedom to do basic research for which we stand. Thank you for that. Um, thanks for being here. My name is Benjamin Bergner. I'm a program officer at 1014, um, which is the organization running a, a fantastic building at 1014 Fifth Avenue, where the Goethe house used to be before moving here. Um, you might um, have been to the building. I see some familiar faces here. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. We're also having events with partners like the Goethe Institute here, and we're really glad you all came. Um, thank you to Paul. Thank you to Andreas. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dean, I think, and um, we're, wish us all a fantastic evening um, with this program tonight. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all on a day with weather appropriate for an event about loss. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to have not only Professor Andreas Reckwitz here, but also our neighbor from the new school just next door, uh, Professor Paul Kotman. Uh, you can view Professor Kotman's book over there, uh, which we have on display, as well as the two most recent books published by Polity Press, which Jörg already mentioned. The discount code you have, so you can uh, purchase that online. Uh, and this is, uh, both of these books were funded by the Goethe Institute um, as part of our global translation grant program. 
I will just introduce Paul Cotman now, who is a professor of comparative literature and the chair of liberal studies at the New School for Social Research. He's the author of Love as Human Freedom, published by Stanford University Press. That's the one we have over there. Tragic Conditions in Shakespeare and Politics of the Scene, published by Stanford. So thank you uh, for being here, Paul, and please welcome Professor Paul Codman. I need to lower this because I'm not... Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Dean for this uh, invitation and the opportunity to, to read um, Andreas Rakvitz's work and to discuss it with you tonight. Um, I'll just talk for maybe uh, 10 minutes um, by way of introduction to give a kind of warm up um, for the lecture that will follow and the conversation that will follow after that. I'll keep it to under 10 minutes as best I can. Um, so I spent uh, a very happy um, Sunday and Monday um, with, with two books, and in particular, the most recent book by Andreas Reckwitz called um, The End of Illusions, which treats um, the shift from industrial modernity to late modernity, as he calls it, to globalization, where the concern is how the, the structural features, as, as he calls it, of the shift um, between industrial modernity and late modernity puts into question the progressivist view of history. So the book is interested in this tension between the kinds of narratives we often tell ourselves about progress um, in modernity. Um, and he notes, for instance, how um, right around 1990, right when I was starting college, um, that um, people like Francis Fukuyama talked about the end of history and a kind of triumphantist narrative um, about the increasing rationalization of modern political institutions and modern economic life. And if you go home tonight and Google Francis Fukuyama, you'll see that he's back at it, writing in the contemporary press um, about, the, about the end of history. Um, and this sits in a kind of uncomfortable tension, let's say, with when you flip the page of the newspaper away from, from Fukuyama's editorials, you'll, you'll read dystopian accounts of responses to the pandemic and, and worries about um, climate change in the future. And so um, Rekvitz's book is interested in this tension, even a contradiction, which he calls something like manic depressives, where we go from boundless euphoria one moment to feelings of profound hopelessness the next. I think everyone in the room can relate to what he what he means by that. Um, somewhat more um, precisely, his book examines what he calls, and I'm quoting, contradictory structures of contemporary society in a way that, avoid, that avoids both the oversimplistic narrative of progress as well as the alarmist diagnosis of social decay, end quote. So these issues, just to take a step back from them to kind of try to motivate and introduce the discussion, these issues are taken up and are endemic to what many call the modernity problem. Um, really, over the last four centuries, you can go back at least to Descartes in the early 17th century, when Descartes spoke on the one hand of mastering nature or enjoying the fruits of the earth without toil. And from our perspective today, we can say, well, you know, modern medicine and agriculture make Descartes look rather prescient. Um, we have vaccines and we live longer and healthier lives, grow taller, and so on. Um, and also in political modernity, since at least Hobbes, we have an increasing rationalization of political institutions away from dynastic rule toward the modern state, um, an expansion of the middle class and wealth around the world, a rise in living standards, all kinds of reasons to be triumphantist and progressive, progressivist in our narratives about this. And something like this progressive narrative is embedded in modernity's self-understanding insofar as we see ourselves as different from, but also an answer to, or a critical response to, the traditions that came before. Now, if there was once a pre-modernity in human history, then it was a time when we might say human beings had ways of transmitting forms of social life from one generation to the next. In terms of tonight's lecture, we might say that these were times in human history, pre-modern times, 
when the passing or the loss of one generation was redeemed by the emergence of the next. You could even say that pre-modernity was an era in human history when loss was not yet really loss. And that modernity, whatever else we mean by it, is the era in which the non-transcendence of death cannot be culturally avoided. These are the themes I think we're going to hear something about this evening. At any rate, it seems reasonable to think of modernity as an age in which, on the one hand, generational transmission remains our task, such that historical progress in any evaluative sense of how we stand vis-a-vis -vis our ancestors starts to look questionable. This story is complicated, but in the period that interests Andreas Kleckwitz the most, what emerges in the middle of the 19th century, not only with industrialization, but also with serious doubts of the sorts that I'm sketching about what had been the triumphantist narrative of enlightenment self-understanding. And these doubts were first registered, if you think about it, by poets and artists and novelists and painters. Um, this is the Goethe Institute, so I'll mention German names, you know, Thomas Mann and Paul Klee, but you could think of Monet or Tolstoy. Um, to real explicit critiques of this notion of progress in figures like Marx and Nietzsche and Freud. And so a kind of crisis in modernity's self-understanding by the turn of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, another interesting feature I just want to flag that you might hear in the talk tonight, and you can definitely read in the books, um, are, um, are what Rick Fitz wants to call a realistic social analysis of social transformation which he suggests shares crucial features with Sigmund Freud's study of individuals and culture. Rakefitz puts it this way, quote, psychoanalysis makes no promises to resolve contradictions into a reconciled harmonious existence. Instead, psychoanalysis brings paradoxes and ambivalences to light in order to reflect upon them and then take realistic steps to changing circumstances, end quote. I think this is a really intriguing way of thinking about what sociology might do. And if we leave aside for a moment the issue of the analysis of individuals and just stay at the level of the analysis of societies or social transformation, then one suggestion of Freud's seems worth briefly commenting on in light of tonight's lecture topic. When Freud analyzes works of art by Michelangelo or by da Vinci, for instance, or even dreams in the interpretation of dreams, He's very eager to see in artworks and dreams the work of wishing for a future reality that is different or perhaps better than the one we find ourselves bound to. Dreams and artworks seem to Freud to do the work of wishing for everything that contemporary reality leaves unfinished, as if a kind of progress were being blocked in reality, which however we feel to be blocked because of what we can otherwise envision or dream or wish for. This Freudian way of looking at things might brush against the grain a little of what Rickwitz calls the sociological analysis of the con contradictory structures of modernity. Since for Freud, it's what we cannot fully remember or make transparent, even as contradictory, that shapes our identity. Put another way, and here's where I'll leave it, to return to the modernity issue at stake in the lecture tonight and in Rickwitz's work, Modernity's relation to its own past, like that of a psychoanalytic patient, must be told again and again in what is again and again the present. Modernity's past or prehistory overwhelms us. And this is, after all, what makes the issue of loss so central to what it means to be modern. So with that, I would like to turn the flow over to, to Andreas Reichwitz, who was, I'll, be, I'll briefly read you the biography, born in Witten in 1970 studied sociology, political science, and philosophy at the universities of Bonn, Hamburg, and Cambridge, and after professorships at the University of Konstanz and the European University in Viadrina, he's now professor of general sociology and cultural sociology at the Humboldt Universität in Berlin, and he's held numerous fellowships and professorships in Germany and abroad, including at the University of California, Berkeley, the London School of Economics, universities of Freiburg, Heidelberg, Witten, and Bielefeld in the Institute for Advanced Studies in Vienna and the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, and is currently uh, the holder of a fellowship at the Thomas Mann House um, in the United States. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us, and um, I look forward to the discussion.
still on. So. Yeah, dear audience, um, thank you very much, Paul, for the very friendly introduction, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation here to New York, to Goethe Institute. I'm very pleased and honored um, to be here. Just as you heard, um, at the moment I'm based in Los Angeles, uh, so that was an interesting shift now from the West Coast uh, to the East Coast. And um, what I would like to uh, do today is to share some, um, some arguments and in a certain outline uh, with you, uh, which is the basis of a, of a current book project, a book project and in fact a research program, which one could say a research program on loss in sociology, on loss as a social phenomenon, not only as a psychological phenomenon, which is very com common, I would say, but uh, as uh, um, something which is social, which is cultural, and which is uh, well, also a paradoxical constellation of modern society. This is what interests me. But just as I said, this is a work in progress. So um, at the moment, I'm still very open for questions and for doubts and for impulses also from, from your side. Um, I hope you don't mind that I will read the text as I'm not a native speaker in English. I think that would be more precise uh, to do that, but then we have, uh, of course, the occasion to enter into a discussion, to first into a dialogue and then into a hopefully broader discussion. A systematic sociology of loss has yet to be written. Unlike psychology or cultural critique, social analysis does not have an established concept of loss. This is strange and understandable at the same time. It is strange because modern society cannot even be understood without its dynamics of loss, without collective experiences of loss and their social and cultural consequences. In today's late modernity, themes of loss from the rage felt by the so-called losers of modernization to our fears of loss in the face of climate change have become especially vivid. The lack of any sociology of loss is, on the other hand, understandable when one recognizes that the discipline is characterized to some extent by a deformation professionnelle. In the form in which it was institutionalized in the 20th century, sociology essentially identifies with the project of modernity as a progress, as a process of progress. Of course, there is a critical strain of sociology that attempts to identify modernity's pathologies, but these pathologies usually seem to stem from the fact that modern society is not progressive enough. Losses, however, are modernity's other, so to speak. They are the other or opposite of progress. How can we approach the phenomenon of loss as a social and as a cultural phenomenon? Let me begin by stating a fundamental finding. Modern society is characterized by a basic loss paradox. Western modernity is a type of society that in the name of promising progress enforces an existential reduction of loss, on the one hand, from sickness and natural catastrophes to premature death. They all have to be reduced. Losses have to be reduced and can be reduced. At the same time, it is a society that has entailed from its very beginning an enormous potential for loss through various mechanisms from accelerated social change to the politics of violence. That is to say, there is an increase of losses uh, taking place in modern societies. This reality, however, is opposed by efforts to make loss systematically invisible, by institutionalized efforts, one could say, to render loss um, invisible to an invisibility of losses. By orienting itself towards progress, that is, by viewing its own history and its own future in terms of ongoing improvement, modernity has, one could say, no choice but to marginalize loss and grief so as to ensure that the economy, politics, science, and technology can continue to advance unimpeded. However, losses cannot be fully suppressed in modernity. Instead of complete suppression, what has developed are modes of processing and articulating loss, practices of loss, 
doing loss, narratives of loss and loss-related cultures of emotion. The social dynamics of loss cannot be confined to the social periphery, and in late modernity, that would be my argument, in fact, the effect of exp experiencing loss is clear to see right in the center of society. The question is, how do we deal now with that problem? In order for you to understand the sociological perspective on loss that I intend to outline today, however, I should first issue a few warnings. This is because my research program can easily be misunderstood. First of all, I'm not concerned with writing a history of modern loss. That is, I'm not interested in putting modernity on trial for all the losses it has caused. Such an effort would belong to the genre of cultural critique, and as can be found, for instance, in Alastair McIntyre's book, After Wordship. There are a lot of books with this after that, the loss of community, the loss of religion, and so on. A sociology of loss, as I understand it, does not make claims from the observer's perspective about everything that has ostensibly been lost in modernity. Rather, it aims to reconstruct how losses are perceived, interpreted, and experienced in society itself by social groups, institutions, or discourses. And I think this is the interesting sociological point. How is loss perceived in society itself, not how? Do I perceive losses? Second, the sociology of loss is more than an intellectual history of cultural critique. Of course, discourses of loss since Jean-Jacques Rousseau's work on alienation are themselves an important component of, moderns, of modernity's dynamic of loss. And Paul has just uh, alluded to some other work from literature, and there is, of course, this huge tradition of cultural critique. However, powerful experiences of losing exist beyond such intellectual discourses, and I think this is important to stress. Think of refugees, the trauma of diasporas, or the anonymous people who lost so much during the processes of industrialization or deindustrialization. Third, it should not be presupposed that loss is an exclusively conservative phenomenon. That is, of course, tempting to put it in that box of conservatism. Of course, classical political conservatism has been fueled since Edmund Burke by the pain of loss. On, on, the hand, on one hand, however, the political left has also cultivated its own experiences of loss, and this should be stressed. From Walter Benjamin's observations about left-wing the melancholia to complaints about the loss of the welfare state and of the industrial workforce at the beginning of the 20th century. On the other hand, many experiences of loss are difficult to classify politically or are fundamentally ambivalent from modern ways of dealing with death to the consequences of the Anthropocene. Fourth, the sociology of loss is not identical to the psychological perspective of the same phenomenon. Anyone interested in finding a rich body of literature on this topic will have to turn to the field of psychology and particularly to psychotherapy which has grappled for so long, for instance, with the issue of grief. From a sociological perspective, however, loss is interesting as a social phenomenon that gives rise to practice, social practices and discourses of loss, structures of emotion that typify social groups, and social arenas in which losses are processed. And I will um, proceed now in my lecture in three steps. I will begin with this, um, certain conceptual clarifications. What is loss? What are we talking here about? The second point is then this loss paradox of modernity, which I already have alluded to. And the third um, aspect then is what is changing now? What happens now in late modernity and how are we now in a new constellation of loss? So how can losses be defined? This question I think, is not so trivial as it seems um, at first sight. Essentially, loss designates a condition in which something previously in existence has disappeared, and this disappearance is evaluated negatively. On account of their negative evaluation, losses are often associated with corresponding negative emotional or affective states. In this regard, however, it is important to differentiate disappearance from loss. Entities disappear constantly in the social world. People or things cease to exist, norms or positions of status lose significance, etc. But such a disappearance does not necessarily need to be experienced as a loss. 
much simply forgotten. In fact, the social act of forgetting is an essential mechanism with which the social world comes to term with its past. Thus, it is only possible to speak of losses when actors, groups, discourses, or institutions perceive their loss as such, when they have negative feelings about something no longer existing, and thus when they mourn in the broader sense that which has disappeared, a perception and interpretation that can be strongly contested by others, and then we have a quarrel about losses. In any case, but the interpretation of loss has very real consequences, the most immediate of which being the development of specific emotions of loss. Traditionally, what comes to mind here is grief or sadness, but other affects are conceivable, including rage, anger, or bitterness. And why are perceptions of loss associated with negative affects? In psychology, studies of loss aversion have demonstrated that the intensity of negative evaluations in the case of losses is usually stronger than the intensity of positive evaluations in the case of gains. Even more fundamentally, one can submit that losses are so emotionally charged because the identities of individuals or of social groups are deeply affected by loss, even damaged. Sigmund Freud made this clear in Mourning and Melancholia. So we have Freud again here. Only which, only that which was once loved, only that which was once loved can be mourned. Or to put this in more general terms, when a loss is perceived as such, this presupposes that there was once a positive emotional bonding to what was lost. This emotional bonding to X or Y was central to someone's identity or to a person's or group's subjective or collective self-perception. And thus, when X or Y disappears, this leads at least um, partly to a loss of identity. This applies to express that not only to people lost in life, but also to lost homelands, lost status, and lost control. What is it then? that can be lost. After all, it is important to clarify the range of sociologically relevant entities that one can lose. First to consider are concrete material entities, the death of other people, chronic illnesses, the loss of objects. Many socially relevant losses, however, are more abstract. These include, for one, social, social losses in the strict sense, such as the loss of social status, which is the disappearance of a socially recognized position or the loss of power. Cultural losses, for their part, can be described as the erosion of formally established systems of interpretation and modes of experience. Not to be overlooked, too, are economic losses. In addition to the loss of money, assets, or capital, losses of value in the symbolic economy should also be kept in mind. Finally, there is the broad sphere that includes this loss of abstract stabilizing authorities, the perceived loss of order and security, the loss of control, and the loss of expectations, particularly the loss of positive expectations for the future. This latter type of loss is an interesting case indeed. At first, when dealing with losses, two levels of temporality necessarily come into play, the present and the past. In principle, what is mourned as a loss is always a bygone state. For the articulation of loss, however, that which is lost, and by definition absent, is paradoxically made present again. Thus we find ourselves in the broad research field of memory studies um, with its uh, branches in cultural theory and social sciences. But on top of this, even the future can be lost, or to be more precise, positive expectations for the future. Expectations for a better future, which are so typical of modernity, can themselves, in other words, lose legitimacy and plausibility. Here, to some extent, we are dealing with a loss of the future. For a sociology of loss, it is central that perception experiences of losses can be collectively shared and that they are influenced or defined by social forms. So they, they are not really a question of individuals and their 
psychic structures. This is where practices of loss, discourses of loss, and arenas of loss come into play. In the first case, when I think of the practices and rituals of mourning deaths, of mourning deaths, but there are also legal practices, for example, concerned with the restitution of losses suffered, not to mention preventive practices in which anticipated potential losses are strategically negotiated. One specific type of practice in this regard are discursive practices, discourses of loss. And here, complex and, of course, very interesting and rich narratives of loss are produced and disseminated. And what I mean by this are narrative models that meaningfully embed individuals, individual or collective losses, for instance, in theology, in psychological self-help literature, failure as an opportunity, for example, in political texts, histories of the fall of nations or the fall of peoples, and not least in the fictional genres of literature and film. Beyond practices and narratives of loss, social arenas of loss also come into play, and they uh, would say for a research program on loss, they are um, extremely important. What I mean by this are public, institutionalized contexts in which losses are socially negotiated. An elementary theme of such negotiations is the extent to which a socially recognized loss exists in the first place. In this respect, Jules Butler has discussed the contentious question of grievability. What is grievable in society? Jeffrey Alexander has pursued a similar question in his analysis of cultural trauma. In order for a trauma to be recognized as such, there often needs to be extensive public debates about the matter. So I reach my second part now, the question of the paradoxical constellation of loss in uh, modernity. Of course, in the spirit of a kind of existential philosophy, one could proclaim that having to suffer and deal with losses is a fundamental aspect of being human. Within the framework of a general cultural theory, moreover, it could be argued that the way in which one deals with losses represents a challenge faced by every culture and every society from the earliest beginnings to today. Against this backdrop, however, West modernity has reshuffled the cards. And so I would like to um, um, put this question of loss or the, the analysis of loss in, in this context of, of West modernity. Modern society is based on a temporal and evaluate, evaluative scheme that is progress-oriented and highly unusual historically, as Reinhard Kozelek uh, demonstrated. Modern society does not proceed from the assumption that social production is the normal state of affairs. According to this assumption, the present is and should be like the past. Instead, it, modernity, presupposes the normality of social change, so that the present is structurally different from past, and the future will in turn be different from the present. In principle, this structural change seems, and that is, uh, of course, the most important point for, for modernity, seems like a shift toward something better. Within this framework of progress-oriented thinking, losses are, strictly speaking, logically impossible. In this regard, modernity's utopian visions are both telling and misleading. Images of societies without loss, without suffering, without grief. According to this line of thinking, the past is made to appear by definition as something obsolete, as something worse, and certainly as something we don't need to feel sorry about, as it is undone by the process of creative destruction. Against this background, modern society has developed, one could say, two basic strategies for making losses disappear. The strategy of loss reduction concentrates on fundamental existential experiences of loss and attempts to eliminate losses, so to speak, objectively by means of various techniques and procedures. This strategy trains its crosshairs above all on the dangers posed by nature, severe illnesses, and early death. Modern medicine, medicine is a grandiose machine designed to reduce the experiences of loss to which human beings are exposed, and its goal is to postpone, as long as it possible, the greatest loss of all, namely death. Loss reduction goes hand in hand with efforts to render loss invisible, though. Whereas some losses no longer occur, 
that those that nevertheless persist or even arise in you are necessarily marginalized by the institutional complexes of modern society with the hope of making them disappear. Modernity's central institutional complexes operate according to a systemic logic that, that depends, as it were, on a progress coefficient without which it would be faced with a serious crisis. This progress imperative, however, is in, inextricably linked to the act of making loss invisible. Just to give some examples, modern capitalism operates on the basis of ultimately fictional but always positive expectations for the future. Investment and borrowing depend on this. Without this fictitious goal of increasing wealth and distributing goods ever more efficiently, the modern economy would, could not exist. If losses occur in this sphere, this must always seem to be no more than a temporary phenomenon. The modern state and modern politics are also based on the invisibility of loss. Since the French Revolution, the aim of modern politics has been the continuous improvement of living conditions. Sustained periods of decline would shatter the legitimacy of modern politics. The idea of taking losses into consideration is also completely alien to modern science and technology. Here, anyone who opposes technological and scientific progress and mourns what has been lost seems like a veritable enemy of progress. Finally, the modern form of life, which is established in the middle class, is also influenced by an imperative of progress, of more and better, and in this way it is loss averse. This is a way of life that depends on social advancement, social, social advancement, increased prosperity, and greater self-realization in one's own life, or at least for the later generation. Therefore, loss can only be understood in terms of failure, and the individuals in question are considered to be responsible for that. Against this cultural backdrop, it is no surprise that the 20th century witnessed a notable erosion of rituals and practices of mourning that pertain to the ultimate existential loss, human death. Philip Ariel has even spoken of the, of the wild or forbidden death of modernity. The paradox, however, is striking. Whereas modern society with its orientation toward progress must cast doubt on the legitimacy of experiencing loss, certain structural conditions of this society actually increase the probability that loss will be perceived and experienced. A number of modernity's structural principles, most of which are quite familiar to social analysis, can be interpreted as forces that, expand, expand, that increase experiences of loss. To name just a few, modern society is characterized by its historically unprecedented pace of social change, whether planned or unplanned. Such change which affects economic, political, technological, social, and cultural structures regularly takes place within the lifetime of subjects. Over the course of a single life, in other words, the chances are high that one will be confronted with revolutions, shifts in values, the decline of social classes, economic restructuring, etc. A second factor that increases the potential for loss is the great complexity of modern society, which has become more and more globally networked. Sociological theories of complexity have dealt with this issue in detail. If a very large number of processes and structures are interconnected, relatively minor events can have large and sometimes cascading effects. Regardless of whether we speak, speak of tipping points, chaos points, or butterfly effects, the extensive, highly specialized, and highly interdependent networks of social practices that constitute modern society are to a great extent vulnerable to the consequences of unplanned processes that are nonlinear and thus hardly predictable. A single terrorist attack can incite an entire world war the collapse of a single local bank can trigger a global economic crisis, and we had other examples now with COVID-19, of course. The high, this high degree of vulnerability in, in highly differentiated societies increases the probability that institutions and social groups will be confronted with negative effects, and thus occasions uh, for experiencing losses. 
A third factor that contributes to the increased potential for loss in modernity is the economization of the social. In modern society, many social arenas that were once governed by the logic of origin have been converted as social arenas governed by the logic of achievement and competition. In this case of scarce goods, however, such competitive structures lead to win-lose situations with the winners on one side and the losers on the other. If losses continue to add up, there will soon be a point of no return. The loser has thus become a veritable social figure of competitive modernity. Finally, the violent effects of West modernity must be stressed as a central condition behind its tendency to increase experiences of loss. Counter to modernity's self-description as a pacified, peaceful civilization, there exists an inseparable nexus between modernity and violence for, uh, for, um, above all exerted by the state. The project of modernity is to implement a rational order, and therefore the campaign to suppress or eliminate anything that stands in the way of this order is built right into this project. The totalitarian violence of the fascist and communist systems in Europe of the 20th century sent out there, as does the systematic violence of the two world wars and the multitude of local wars, not to mention the effects of colonialism and imperialism. The systematic murder, expulsion, social exclusion, and treatment of certain positions of the population is thus an inherent feature of modern societies. This means, however, that existential experiences of loss, the long-term trauma of those affected and of those left behind, are not only tolerated, but also deliberately inflicted in Western modernity. Despite all the structural tendencies toward making loss invisible, the actual potentiation of loss in modernity has led to the fact that such experiences cannot be suppressed. They are in fact articulated, and they all have always been articulated in the history of modernity, and these articulations have given rise to practices of processing loss, of doing loss, to the practices, narratives, affects, and arenas that I have already mentioned. This phenomenon can be traced throughout the entire history of modernity. Since the 1980s, and thus within the historical phase that can be called late modernity or other talked of post-modernity, the articulation of loss has no longer been restricted to, to the margins. In visual terms, the experience of loss has moved from the periphery to the center, where the orientation toward progress and the inclination to ignore or forget about losses are now on the defensive. In present-day society, the clear trend is to escalate loss and become sensitive to it. This can be observed in a wide variety of social arenas. And this is my third and last part of, uh, um, of the lecture, what is changing now concerning losses in contemporary society. One dramatic effect on the escalation of anticipated, of anticipated losses was caused by our insights into climate change. Such insights have increased society's anticipation of loss in the future to an extent that is unprecedented in modernity. By now, it has become a certainty that areas of the populated Earth will become uninhabitable in the near future, and that the quality of life in these places will deteriorate on account of heat, extreme weather, or flooding. In order to mitigate this development, if nothing else, it seems advisable to renounce our customary standards of consumption and mobility. We have thus begun to think about losses in the future perfect. We will have lost something, but what comes after that? The anticipation of loss, in other words, can therefore fuel the fear of loss. This is not merely a matter of assuming that there will be specific losses in the future, reduced wealth, existential losses, losses of control, etc. Rather, debates about climate change and the Anthropocene have cast doubt on the entire modern model of having positive expectations for the future. It would not be outlandish to say that the future itself has been lost. The prospect of a better future, which all previous parameters have once led us to expect, now seems utterly naive. 
Not only, however, are anticipations of loss on the rise, losses suffered in the recent past are increasing as well. In this case, for example, we are dealing with the much discussed loses of modernization, at least that's the term in, in German sociology, in the societies of Western and Eastern Europe and in North America as well. Here, the decisive factor has been the structural change from industrial modernity to post-industrial late modernity, which is characterized by the processes of globalization and neoliberalization. The consequences of this transition are well known. To a great extent, the industrial workforce has been replaced by a poorer and less respected service class. Many regions outside of large cities are being abandoned. The welfare state of industrial modernity has become porous and new competitive structures, for instance, in the housing market and in education, are leaving people behind. In addition to a loss of social status among the lower third of these societies, the consequences of losing cultural power and identity-defining privileges have also affected the traditional middle class. On, the emotion, on an emotional level, these losses of status and power have given rise not only to grief, but also to feelings of rage, bitterness, and resentment. Many of today's political movements, I would say, are in fact motivated by loss, such as political populism, social movements like the Gilles Jaune in France and the Brexit movement in Britain. The anticipation of ecological loss and the recent social losses caused by the process of modernization have been matched by a structural change in politics, which is equally interesting. The sort of politics that is oriented towards ideas of social progress has increasingly so it seems, being replaced by a, by a politics of risk. The offensive politics of positivity, which seeks to create better conditions in the future, has been more and more displaced by a defensive politics of negativity, which dwells on negative future events, attempts to calculate their risk factor, and then implements preventive measures with the hope of mitigating their future occurrence. Whether confronting the effects of climate change or reacting to certain chaos points in which small local causes trigger massive global consequences, as in the case of the 2008 financial crisis or the COVID-19 pandemic, the political system itself seems to be affected by fears of a lost future, so much so, so, much so that skeptical goals such as crisis management, prevention, and resilience have become strong in political discourse. So in the political imaginary, the idea of society's perfectibility is gradually being replaced by the idea of its vulnerability. The late modern loss of the future is also reflected in the aesthetic, pop cultural, and intellectual trend to depict catastrophic scenarios which dramatize loss. In late modern fiction, the future as catastrophe, as Eva Horn um, calls this phenomenon, has become one of the most popular themes. So much is clear from the rising popularity of dystopian science fiction, such as Dale Pandell's The Great Bay Chronicles of the Collapse. There is also the great popularity of catastrophic future narratives in movies and television shows, as in the widely watched TV series The Handmaid's Tale, which was based on Margaret Edwards' novel of the same name. Since the year 2000, the genre of, as John Yuri called it, new cat cat catastrophism, sorry, um, has been a strong presence on the trade book market. Here, analyses of the decline of foreign civilizations, such as jarred diamonds, collapse, how societies choose to fail or succeed, attract a great deal of attention and do prognosis of imminent catastrophes, especially of an ecological sort. In this respect, Pablo Selvinia and Raphael Stevens' book on collapsology is just the tip of the iceberg. Coming from a completely different angle, the late modern culture of memory also contributes to the dynamics of loss in political and cultural spheres. What is new is that social groups around the world for whom the violent expansion of Western modernity had traumatic effects are publicly articulating these memories of loss and are in part demanding restitution. 
Over the last decade, this has been most prominent in the growing awareness of the consequences of European colonialism, for instance, in debates about stolen art in European museums, but it has also been prevalent in the debates about the ongoing consequences of Americans' slavery and the persistence of racism. In retrospect, the testimonies by Holocaust victims since the 1960s can be interpreted as a historical breakthrough for a type of memory politics that focuses on collective suffering and loss caused by violent state crimes. As a result of these testimonies, more and more victims of violence have stepped out of shadows of social shame and invisibility and entered the light of national or global public awareness. Late modernity's culture of memory is focused on, as Chakrabarti's terms, historical wounds, and it has become a locus of debate about trauma, victims, and responsibility. In general, one should not overlook the fact that, and that's my last aspect, that in late modernity, the escalation of loss goes hand in hand with the hate and sensitivity to it. This hate and sensitivity to loss also has a psychological dimension. Since the 1990s, psychology has de-tabooed the topics of grief, separation, failure, trauma, etc., and it has turned to the therapeutic, therapeutic question of how deal approximately, uh, sorry, uh, appropriately and constructively with negative events in one's life and how to develop counter strategies such as, for example, resilience. So again, the term resilience becomes important. This fits with a particular psychological structure that has obviously sensitized the late modern subject also to negative experiences. To anyone familiar with the rise or psychogenesis of the emotional self, it is clear that the late modern subjects have considerably differentiated and intensified their emotionality since the 1970s and 80s. This emotionalization, however, allows not only pleasant occasions, but also, as a rather paradoxical consequence, negative events such as experiences of loss to be felt more intensively. And this, of course, has brought psychotherapy into play. I come to an end now. From the beginning, experiences of loss have been part of the process of modernization. Along with their causes and effects, they should become the object of sociological analysis, which they have in this, to that extent never been before. The paradox of loss, the contradictory relationship between and among the reduction of loss, the concealment of loss, the increase of loss, and the ways in which we process it is characteristic of Western modernity. In today's late modern society, this paradox itself has obviously lost its fragile balance. The imperative of progress is losing credibility while losses are coming to the fore. Can experiences of loss somehow be integrated into the project of progress? How can this project be revived? Is this, is this possible at all? In the end, the appropriate way of dealing with experiences of loss beyond the extremes of suppressing it or fixating on it has become an urgent problem for the societies and the on the individuals of today and of the near future. Thank you very much. Feels like a television show format on these chairs. Um, so thanks so much for this really stimulating lecture. Um, I'd like to begin, I, I hope, by um, by by um, by restating in my own words what I take to be the core idea that you're offering us, also to get conversation going. And then ask you a question about it as, as directly as I can. I mean, the core idea seems to be, as you begin by saying, that losses are modernity's other because it's the opposite of progress. 
and and that um, progress has to find ways of turning everything into gain or profit. This is the impetus behind the reference to capitalism. Um, and, and so that against this background, you, you want to point out that loss, um, because it's, 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 modernity, it's progress is other, a modernity is other, that it seems like a paradox, what you call a paradox, that modern societies, I'll read from the lecture since I have the advantage of having the text, um, modern society must cast doubt on the legitimacy of experiencing loss and yet increase the probability that loss will be perceived from experience. And, and so you, you call this a, a paradox. And, and as, I, as I think about it, and here's, here's my question as directly as I, as I can ask it, is that it strikes me that this isn't a paradox exactly, but that progress and increased loss must go together. So that it seems to me that loss is not progress's other, it's progress's hidden secret condition. Um, and let me see if I can get at what I mean by this. So that you, you refer to Kozelik at a certain point to define progress as, um, as the assumption that the present is structurally different from the past and that the future will turn out to be different from the present. So there's a kind of logic of history at work in any progressivist view of history, namely that um, not that the present should be like the past, not that we should inherit our for, for, forebearer's way of doing things, but that the present should always be hyper-present. Um, you know, do away with the past. And if, if that progressivist view is, is correct, and I think it is, I think Kozelik gets that exactly right. Um, my, here's my question, I'm finally arriving at it. Um, that means that the progressivist view of history by definition has to bury all the particular losses that went into traditional ways of transmitting social life between generations. In other words, once the progressivist view is taken up, the losses multiply from the get-go. And if that's not, if that's not wrong, then, then there's no tension between loss and progress and, and no paradox. And so this is, this is, this is my, my question to you. See. Yeah, thank you very much. This is, of course, a very uh, demanding question already quite at the beginning. Um, well, yeah, but let me um, begin it this way. Um, well, what struck me at, um, at the beginning when, when working on this topic really was there was hardly any literature on the sociology of loss. And that's so strange. Yeah? As uh, what's when you, um, when you look into the bi biographies, um, there's so much about the psychology of loss. And that's, of course, um, a huge topic in, in psychology, psychotherapy, and so on, loss, mourning, grief, and so on, and understandably. Uh, but why not from the uh, perspective of society? Yeah? So I'm not, well, sociology might be also a very historically specific um, enterprise, but study of society should deal with that. And there was only one uh, book on that, and mainly from Peter Maris, um, an, I think American or British anthropologist from 1973, and this has the title Loss, Loss and Change. So that is a very um, a direct and a very interesting, and I think good and valuable book that didn't have any influence after in 1973, so it was forgotten in a way. And then there are some articles about sociology of loss, but very much on a micro sociological level, again, this question how do you individuals with that? But then the question is, how do you, how would societies with the social rules? And this is, um, um, in a way, strange. So what I would like to, um, what my project is, in a way, to uh, to get an awareness for social analysis for this phenomenon. That's the first step. Yeah? And I think that's what I call here a research program. I could do that, well, I cannot do that uh, alone, of course. I think many people could do that together to have that huge, this mapping of uh, 
how do social groups with losses in the whole history of modernity, but also in pre modern society in another way and so on. That could be really interesting, but it has not it has not been so interesting in, in the past. I would say because of this imperative of progress, which leads us to leave that behind and to think that's not interesting anymore, or to see that only as a um, side of conservatism and so on. So that's the first point. And then, um, of course, now the question is how to theorize this, uh, how is, um, does Western modernity as a society which has been developing since the, 19th, since the 18th century, so that's, of course, also a whole of course, a longer history of modernity, and how has uh, that dealing has been dealing with losses? And what I mean now, what the, of course, you could say um, the loss is the other side of modernity. And I said that uh, there at one point, in a way that's that's true. But I found it more interesting, also analytically, to say, well, the interesting point is also modernity, that is, the structural features of modernity. On the one hand, they decrease uh, losses, or that they also make them invisible, which is also a kind of decreasing. And on the other hand, they increase them. And they increase them not only as they um, uh, supplant traditional forms of life, but also in the whole history of modernity, which is already uh, 250 years old, they suppress and can and again also the tradition of modernity itself. As for example, industrial forms of life, of life, which uh, used to be at the, the forefront of what modernity was about, uh, also here in the US and in Europe, now they have become old-fashioned and things of the past again. So this goes on and on and on. So it's not it's not anymore only about traditional society, traditional communities, so but it's also about modern forms of uh, structures uh, uh, which also have been um, um, supplanted. And that's, I think, is the interesting point. On the one hand, this decreasing, and there are also real decreasing, like medicine and so on. There is, of course, also a decrease, uh, a reduction of losses, and this should be, I think, recognized um, as also, one might say, uh, an achievement of modernity. And then there is the sense of making losses invisible, and hence the question, how does modern culture do that, which is interesting, also by certain narratives, for example, you don't just say something is only a temporal phenomenon, a temporary phenomenon, and then it will, um, uh, the, the progress comes after that, and so on. So there are a lot of strangers, but on the other hand, that's even a bit, what could say, the, the perversity of modernity, and the, on the one hand, to make losses invisible, but on the other hand, to increase them, yeah? to even produce that, I could say, in all societies, losses are produced, that's not so new, in wars, for example, or uh, otherwise, but modernity, in a way, is also very good at producing losses, both by competition market structures and so on. And that's, I would say that this is, well, I'm not so sure whether in a strong, a strict logical sense, this is a paradox, but also it's a contradiction. So these are two tendencies which, in a way, they, 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 um, they lead in different or in, in, in oppositional direction. And that's, I find, what the interesting point is. And I, in the book, now I try to go deeper into these structures of increasing losses and of decreasing losses. Since, since I'm the, the interlocutor, I get to abuse my position by, by following up. And then I will open the floor for discussion after one more, one more back and forth. Um, I mean, if, if I can, let me see if I can ask basically the same question a different way about, about what you're calling the, the perversity um, of, of um, progress and loss. So if it's true that, that progress seeks to render invisible loss, I think that's right, by being ever present, I don't know why it would follow that that would then decrease actual loss in the sense that okay, maybe I can, yeah. I can get at it um, from um, um, something you said early in the lecture where you say that it's only possible to speak of losses when actors, groups, discourses, or institutions perceive a loss as such. Um, which sounds to me like what, you know, ben, Walter Benjamin, who you mentioned, might think of as history written by the victor. You know, only the losses that get noted as losses count. But that doesn't mean there aren't lots of, or even multiplying, Invisible, yeah. invisible losses. Maybe you. Yeah. Well, I think that's also, of course, a very um, difficult question. Also, when analyzing is 
how do you analyze invisibility? So in a way you can only analyze what is visible and what is not visible, well, no, it's, it's not. but uh, in a way I think that um, you can do that and you can ask um, how does modernity do that with making invisible? And of course, there are different uh, forms of invisibility. One is things are visible by the actors themselves as lost, but they don't enter public discourse. And that's a way, a very important way of making things invisible. That's also, um, for example, topic of, of the theory correctly of Jeffrey Alexander and his books of cultural trauma. Of course, people may have traumas, but when they don't, uh, go, when they don't enter the public, they are made invisible in a way. Yeah? So, but they're still there, but uh, on the social level, uh, they are not there. And then there are other cases in which you could say that even when there is a, a language of, of loss lacking, also individuals are not able really to articulate their own losses. They don't see them as losses. For example, this is also the topic of Ariel in this book on death. When we, have, we haven't, we don't have sometimes we don't have languages to talk about the deaths of uh, of our, our relatives and so on and so even the, the the subjective feeling of loss is in a way um, I don't want to say damaged uh, but it is not um, it can't be articulated in a, in a, in a way. but it, it just let me let me stress one point what I do not want to follow is um, is a certain classical strand of argumentation. Which is, I would say, the argumentation of political conservatism uh, to, to mourn these losses. Um, of identity. This is not my point. Yeah? But in some way, I am on the side also of this. Uh, but I, I think that um, many of us, and including me, are on, they have learned this language of progress. And we see, of course, the progresses and also the values of these progresses. But there is this, this other side which should be, um, which should be made. Um, Visible or, or and which is made visible now. I think this is the process not that we make that visible or I do, but this is the process in our society that losses are made more and more visible, they are articulated, and then uh, and uh, to, to such an extent um, that in some in many ways this this narrative of progress um, loses its legitimation. And this is really, I would say, for Western modernity, a very critical and difficult point. How can modern society um, proceed um, with this weakened uh, sense of progress? And this is, uh, I think there is no answer to that at the moment. Good. So I'm not sure how we want to handle the microphone situation, Dean, but if people want to raise their hand or make Yeah, I have a microphone here, so uh, just raise your hands and I will. That was easy. Well, uh, is, is this. Is this research possibly going to explain to us why we've known about climate change for 50 years and there's been so little action? Is the invisibility of these potential losses a reason why that's remained, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting. As we can say, we know about climate change, as we say, for 50 years or so, but it, um, it, it was an expert topic that has not really entered public discourse, but of course now we could say, well, that's like with the hen and the egg, what is the cause? You know, what is really the, the difficult to say is, is this the cause that we know new facts or that the facts become more and more uh, um, important or is it also a change in discourse which now leads to the fact where we see these, uh, these future losses um, more um, um, in, in, in all their danger. Um, and, and I would really think that uh, well, one reason is that uh, when this narrative of progress becomes weakened in society, the losses which already also were there before, or we knew about that, then these discourses become stronger. And it's, it's, so it's always a question that there is this, um, this uh, very close connection to the narrative of progress. Huh? And, uh, now this is weakened and it has been weakened for several reasons, I would say, in the, in the last decade. Then also the, the fact that climate change can become more, um, when, when can be developed um, greater awareness of that. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, one question, when did uh, progress the ideology of progress become the ruling 
ideology. And why do you think that happened? The question was, uh, why did... Uh, when, when, and, uh, when and why did progress oh, become the dominant the ideology, way, think, the yes. ideology of progress? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, in a way, I think this is quite well researched also in country history. I, I mentioned the um, German um, cultural historian, I don't know whether he's well known yet, yes, Rainer Kuzelik. In this, um, this semantic analysis, he shows that in the, what he calls Sattel Zeit between 1750 and 1850, also this, this term of progress in the modern sense was um, invented. And it, and it became, uh, at first it was really a marginal phenomenon and hardly anybody believed in that. But then in the course of the decades, it, it became so prominent and the, let's say, the, the dominant uh, discourse. So that's about this, um, um, above all, also here in the United States, one could say even more than Europe, the United States um, perceived themselves as the um, um, protagonists of this uh, uh, progress without alternatives. And what for me is what is quite so even more important is well, on the one hand, one could say, of course, this, uh, this um, idea of progress was a, a question of semantics, also of intellectual discourses by French philosophers in German philosophers in their history of philosophy, like Hegel and uh, um, uh, Thurgo and so on. Um, but um, then, and this is very interesting, I'd say this uh, um, intellectual discourse um, has structured more and more the institutional logic of the economy, of politics, of science, of technology, and even of everyday life of middle class. Yeah. So, for example, in philosophy, this um, this idea of progress has been much debated since the 19th century. Later. There are many philosophers who say, well, this is a naive creed and we cannot believe in that anymore. For example, in, in Germany, also the Frankfurt School and the critical theory and so on. That's, of course, very important. There always was much doubt concerning modernity in intellectual and philosoph philosophical circles about all in the 20th century. But nevertheless, I would say, in the institutional logic, Capitalism, of politics, of science, of technology, this imperative of process is really institutionalized. And this is why it is so strong. Not the, well, the intellectually based, they were the, the first step to say that, but even when philosophers do not believe in progress anymore, the institutions do believe in that. And this is, of course, very problematic now at the moment. Yeah? How can we imagine modern institutions maybe with a weaker? imperative of progress. Yeah, it's interesting to imagine that if, if, um, if our institutions had listened to critical theorists of the Frankfurt School sooner um, um, in a way that took up um, um, and institutionalized some of the doubts about progress that they're, um, that they're voicing, that your question would have a, at least a different timing. Are there hands in the room? Uh, th thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question um, uh, concerning the, the previous project and this one. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole idea of uh, singularization on the one hand and now this, this follow-up project maybe. So would you say that um, considering something as a loss is already um, a project of singularizing your existence because then you could say well it is special in a, in a particular sense because now I can feel melancholia or something like this. So uh, that the, the, ex, uh, the experience of loss would be an instance of singularizing your existence and making it important. Or is it, um, is it another version that um, there are uh, other ways of, of dealing with the past? Loss is one of them. It has nothing to do with the pre uh, previous project. What, yeah. what, what would you say? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, that was very tricky, of course. Well, um, it, well, this was not my point of departure to say, well, I have dealt with, most of you probably are not, are not aware of that, with, with singularization processes in, in modern and late modern societies. And now I um, uh, apply that to a new field. So, so in a way, it's, it's a new start again. I think this is. I'm not so interested in doing the same things over and over again, but uh, in this, this uh, book is book project is a new start. But it is a new start also in the way, of course, one could say, just as Paul said, um, 
I'm looking at the other side now, well, the process of single elevation are also um, process of, of uh, the winners in a way, of people who are successful in modern and late modern society to singularize themselves and to be um, singular on the attention markets, for example, or in the in, in cultural capitalism and uh, and so on. And then there is the other side of losing and the losers and uh, also of failure on, in, in this context. Um, so, in a, but, so in a way, it's now in, in, a new start and also a new topic, which is maybe negatively related to the other one, but in a way, of course, and that's uh, what this, this is working out. There is a connection between um, between uh, loss and uh, singularization, and and this also uh, came to my mind when uh, reading a book by um, a German philosopher Burkhard Liebsch on grief, and there he says very explicitly um, that uh, when something is grieved and uh, when something is lost, um, it must be um, unexchangeable for the for the subject. It cannot, it cannot be replaced. Otherwise, it would not be grieved. And that's, of course, the, the very definition of singularization. So, and this is very interesting now, of course, for modernity, as one could say, and as, and, um, when modernity singularizes the world more and more, then it also makes us more vulnerable to losses. And was, that was, of course, already the invention of Lamartine. As Romanticism is that culture, which in a very radical and influential way developed this idea of not only individuality but of singularity, the singularity of places, of uh, um, of groups, um, of traditions, of individuals, um, of things, and so on. And at the same time, that was of course also a very intensive uh, culture of, of mourning and grief and uh, broken loves and so on. Also, romantic love, of course. This idea there is one uh, one individual to which I am born, and when this individual dies, so my existence uh, um, uh, loses its uh, um, um, its its meaning, and so on. So, um, singularis um, singularization means when uh, a culture of singularization makes individuals more prone to uh, feeling losses, and when late modernity, if late modernity is a in some respects, quite singularized societies. It's not so, um, it's not by accident or by chance, it also gets more sensitive to loss. As the other, to, just to, to state that, um, the alternative would be to think um, or to, to perceive things as being replaceable. Right? And this also was modernity, it was a characteristic of classical modernity, for example, in law or in consumption, that they were, well, if you lose something, you can replace it by another thing. And so you don't have to mourn that. You don't. You have not lost it in a way. It's, it's replaced by uh, the other, or by the new fashion, or by another place, and so on. And this is also, of course, has always been influential in modernity too. This is also a way of, of making, um, in a very tricky way, of uh, making losses invisible. To have a logic of um, replaceability and. Um, uh, which has worked in, in many respects, and still works some, in, in, in some respects, but uh, uh, the, the more important civilization gets, the more um, um, important gets this vulnerability or proneness or sensitivity to, to losses. I was thinking though, at a certain point in the lecture, you, I thought very interestingly pointed out that sometimes things just get forgotten. Yeah. Or just simply go absent. And I would, I would think even irreplaceable things sometimes just get forgotten or go absent. So a question I have, I mean, it's a, I don't know if this is a question that strikes anyone in the audience, but when does an absence become a loss? Um, that's a question I have actually for you, is it, how is it and when does an absence become a loss? Yeah. Well, well my answer would be with Freud in a way when there have, has been a positive emotional bonding to it. Uh, now disappeared object, human, and so on. Of course, now you can question why was there this uh, emotional bonding and so on. That's also that's a very important question. But I think this, in a way, this um, is the pre-condition, um, at least that could be the first, um, the first thesis. But on the second, um, second side, 
but it becomes complicated again, as one could ask whether something which at first was forgotten later on has a tendency to be perceived as a loss. And we have these kind of problems, for example, concerning nations and their history. Where I think that, for example, when I see the collective in Hungary, in, in, in Europe, there is this tendency now to mourn um, the, the past uh, Austrian-Hungarian empire, but, but that doesn't seem to be a problem for decades uh, after 1945. And now, of course, we would say, well, the loss was suppressed in a way, but maybe it was simply not perceived as a loss, but now that's, of course, a question also of this reinvention of tradition uh, or invention of, uh, of history. Now people uh, deal again with their history, and now they discover a loss, and now they expose, they develop an emotional bond into that. So that's very interesting how these things uh, sometimes uh, work. Um, uh, humanity always was confronted with the question how to preserve information, how not experience. How, how to what? Preserve information. Preserve. Yes, preserve, preserve information. information. And how not experience loss. <laughs> and we created languages and books, and now we are in a library. And uh, Digital technology said we will do it better. We create global library, everybody has access, everybody will be educated, everybody will be great, everything will be great. And now I have books that I bought 40 years ago, they still unchanged. And I cannot access a file that I created like seven years ago because it's going up corrupted or not open at all. And uh, now we also have this problem with fake information because it's um, fake uh, news and fake uh, pictures because it's so easy to corrupt any information, not only to preserve, but now we have easiness with corruption of information. We change it and pre present it as we... And uh, about this uh, <coughs> absence, like <laughs> question of absence. So now we confronted with uh, um, absence of trust, absolute absence of trust. We cannot trust any information because they it could be changed anyway in any uh, direction. So and uh, also we have these. Uh, losses all the time. We cannot trust anything. So could you address this um, speed of losses? Like we experience more, more, more and more, uh, more often, often and often. And this absence of trust, this loss of tr trust absolutely, completely yeah. in some, in some places, it's absolute, absolute. Right. I, th I think if I understand your question, it's, it's something like this, that on the one hand, we have ever greater capacities to archive and record, for example, in digitization, but already with photography and with recording technologies. Um, and on the other hand, ever piling up losses. And so it's something like the, the paradox that you were addressing in your talk, this ever greater pass capacity to preserve yeah. and conserve an archive. Yeah. Um, and how would you address that? Yeah, yeah um, that's very interesting. Point. Well, actually, I see, see two points in your question. The one is about this, this um, relationship between for, forgetting and uh, reproduction in, in culture and how that changes also with the digitalization. The other one is this general question of um, was a loss of trust in, in institutions. And, uh, um, well, the first uh, point, I think this really extremely interesting is um, this, uh, this deals with this question of social forgetting. And what are the conditions of forgetting in society and of, of reproduction? And uh, there are, are some, some studies about this, um, this uh, topic not so many, um, about um, social forgetting. And um, in a way, one could say that this is, um, uh, with, with digitalization, um, the situation changes again. Um, as um, 
where there are so many things which uh, now can be um, put to, a, one could say, institutionalized memory. Yeah? So they are not forgot, completely forgotten, but they are still there. Um, you have access to them, but um, the question is whether they uh, whether they um, they are put into into use again. Well, that, that was already the classical problem with every library, of course. The library is also it's a, it's a institutionalized memory, um, but um, well, the books are not uh, are not read anymore. There is the institutionalized memory, but it is not a memory in practice. And this can happen. And this. Um, would say with, with digitalization now this this problem becomes even more um, um, more important in a way as um, there's hardly anything forgotten anymore yeah? but on the other hand there's the question um, are there other people still interested in them and they can of course become interested again after a decade or 20 years so there's also the sins of the past which are there in a digitalized form and they are there, then they become visible again, again, or they are even manipulated, and they are not really a relic of the past, but they are um, modified in a way. So that's, uh, but I would say that this is really um, a question of this uh, relation with forgetting and, 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 uh, not, and well, that's a topic, of course, related to losses, but I would say it's not, not exactly the same. Um, thank you. I got a question about the notion of loss and the question if this always has to have a negative notion in terms we we forget something, we don't consider something. Um, I ask because I think about economic development and the, the idea that we have to um, yeah refrain from the imperative of uh, endless growth, that we have to rebuild economy in order to have a resilient economy in the future, which means that we might lose some economic power at the moment, but in the long run we gain. So is loss always negative in your yeah. books? Well, that's, uh, of course, well, well, first I need a definition, but then in the course of time the definition becomes more and more complex. We we'll say, well, if we begin, well if to talk about loss, there must be a negative feeling about that, otherwise this term this would only be disappearance and not loss. Huh? And many things, as I said, they disappear, and you are even happy about their disappearance. Well, that's the classical uh, narrative of progress. You can be happy about the disappearance, or the disappearance goes unnoticed, unnoticed, and it's forgotten. And, but um, if you have a closer look, and that's, of course, also a empirical question now, um, that um, often there are redefinitions. That is to say that something um, is not only, the loss is not only negatively interpreted. For example, also in phenomena, this is not what you meant, like nostalgia, there is not only a negative feeling about the loss, but there is also, in a way, a feeling at ease with this feeling of nostalgia itself. So this is the, it's a mixture of negative and positive and uh, um, um, and then there are even the, these um, possibilities that the, the loss is reinterpreted in a way as the loss as gain. And we have that, of course, also in the discourse about climate change, not about the Anthropocene, to say, um, well, this is not really a loss, although uh, well, it seems to be a loss um, at uh, first sight, but um, on the second level, more abstract level, um, these losses are not real losses, but we gain, for example, quality of life in a in a post-carbon uh, world. And, uh, at least in Germany, this is quite uh, prominent also in the ecological discourse to say, to, and well, I don't evaluate that now. We could say this is also a strategy again to make losses invisible. It may be that's also a good strategy to reconcile progress with loss and so on. And uh, in any case, it's an interesting strategy yeah, to, to, um, to combine the negative with the positive. I was thinking you know, about, about your question also after, uh, during the lecture um, about the word negative. And um, in, in Plato, when Plato speaks of grief, the Greek word is akos, which means pain. And that it strikes me that maybe pain or suffering, it's very much from Freud too, is, is what I think you mean by negative. But of course, maybe pain gets a little closer because there can also be pleasurable pains. Yeah. And in the passage in Plato's Republic, Book 10, where he talks about grief. 
um, he's critiquing tragedy and saying that, you know, sometimes when we watch loss on a stage or feel loss, we can get carried away with enjoying it. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe pain might be what's characteristic of, of, of loss, that there's a pinch, um, yeah. which could be pleasurable. Yeah, but I think this is, of course, a very basic question. Do affects simply are there or need, need to be an interpretation uh, before? And I had that while social constructivism idea. You, you need a certain basic interpretation of thing in order to feel something about it. Or what, feeling something about something. And so you have, must have a basic perception or interpretation. But I think it's really an interesting point to see that uh, of course, the, the emotions need not remain negative. Or maybe there can be a, a mixture of negative and positive. Yeah. I thought I saw a hand in the back, not, not the camera. But yes, somebody, Dean, you see behind you? Thank you. I have a few comments and a question. Uh, so you talked about for getting as it contributes to loss, but uh, what about willful erasure? Um, and I was thinking about this, as you mentioned, in, in Hungary, for example, right, where the veneration of Austro-Hungarian Empire is quite high. But that's the case also in the entire Eastern Europe, right? Um, so, and, and I have a feeling like that is done because communism is erased or the experience of communism. And then where do we go past communism? We end up austro hungarian Empire, you know, we end up in the monarchies and all that. So erasure and loss. And the other um, thing that I was thinking about is how loss in traditional societies is a very powerful tool for forming communities, like how entire communities are formed around loss. And I was also recently uh, listening to how um, Georgia Maloney was um, talking about her project in Italy, uh, how um, she wants to recuperate that which has been lost and using that as a form of progress, right? Building up future politics. Um, and my question is more towards, is there a way to talk about loss that does not include psychoanalytical categories? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Is it possible at all, or do we always have to like kind of venture towards grief, yeah. mourning, and so yeah. on? Okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting point, and um, I think you see that this is a, it's a huge project. Yeah? So a lot of this is what I really think do you you need a research institute about um, social loss because, for example, there are many negative, uh, negative but there are many um, phenomena. Um, which are connected to losses. Um, uh, like, for example, uh, we have talked about that failure, yeah? also the concept of failure, and also, for example, now what you uh, mentioned, the, um, uh, the erasure, the erasure or destruction, which is a willful um, making that something should um, go away. It's not a byproduct or something. So it's really an erasure. And um, so, that's really a semantic field yeah, of, of a phenomena connected to one another, and um, one should uh, deal also with the um, 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 with the connections between them. And, and, and the second point, what you said, um, the traditional societies, well, well, as a sociologist, of course, I have that attendant. Um, but sociologists, their speciality is more modernity, modern society. So I'm quite typically, and so I'm quite um, cautious. Um, to say something about so-called traditional societies, and as in the past, sociologists uh, often had a tendency to um, have quite exotic um, ideas and notions of so-called traditional societies. And uh, um, so I, I leave that rather to, to, to the historians or cultural historians, but this would, of course, be a, a highly interesting comparative project also to see how do, for example, uh, does the European um, society of the Middle Ages deal with losses? There are also losses were, um, um, were ubiquitous. And what I, my supposition would be, um, or my assumption would be, well, as they didn't have this modern um, idea of progress and of this imperative of growth institutions, 
there was another kind of dealing with, uh, with losses. Yeah? And so there was not this yardstick of progress. And so probably that was the reason why also losses. For example, what Ariel um, analyzed the, the, these rituals of death in, in Middle Asia, so that they were different. And also you mentioned that with, because with Christianity, you had the idea of an afterlife. And so some losses, losses it didn't seem to be um, 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 the, the end of uh, the end of the story in, in a way. And the, the third point concerning psychoanalysis, well, I'm not so sure. Well, I'm not, um, um, although now it seemed a bit as, as if I were um, 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 a supporter of a psychoanalytical concept, well, I'm quite pragmatic about that in a way. I really think that you can do a social analysis of these phenomena and you need not necessarily uh, use uh, psychological or psychological um, um, psychoanalytic, psychoanalytical concepts. And this is not necessary. This is not necessary. We also have well, emotions studies of emotions and affect and so on in sociology. So this is uh, not uh, only a psychological topic. But I found, uh, I simply found this text uh, by Freud on mourning and melancholia quite instructive in a way. And uh, and I think one could make use of that also for a social analysis. But not uh, we. This is not indispensable. Thinking about your question, I'll just throw in a, a, a book that I'm quite fond of on this topic. It's by an anthropologist called Death Without Weeping. By, I don't know if you know it, by Nancy Shepard Hughes. Mm -hmm. And it's about a, um, it's an exploration or a study of a community in the upper Amazon that um, has the highest infant mortality in the world, where up to one out of two children don't survive till the age of four. Um, and this community has the practice of not giving a name to the children until they reach, I think it's the age of three, I forget the exact, or four. And that if they die as they do, one out of two, before that age, they're not mourned in mm -hmm. the sense that we would say, you know, no weeping, hence the title of the book. So it speaks to your social constructivism yeah. point in really stark, you know, very poignant terms. So it's just a quick way of saying anthropology. You know, that you could you could do um, non psychoanalytic understandings that way. So we got we have time for one more comment, Dean, um, here in this third row. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for the last question. Um, so I would like to know what you think about the aspect of time. So we are very much influ influenced by the idea of linear time. And now we are trying to discuss something else like deep time as Chakrabarti is doing. And yeah, I would like to know about the maybe connection between losing time all the time, like with linear time is going on. And now we are trying to, I don't know, reach something else maybe. Is that, yeah, can I, you understand? I have <laughs> said, um, that I'm not very well, um, and acquainted with his work, which mm -hmm. I was really a uh, shame I should do that. But uh, quite generally, uh, well, well, now with, with dealing with, uh, with the topic of love, I would say that there are three um, very basic, and also social theoretical, and also so social philosophical, basic um, 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 dimensions um, important for that topic. Namely, mm -hmm. one is temporality. <laughs> The second is affectivity, and the third one is narrativity. They are, of course, all very basic topics, also for recent cultural analysis of the last uh, decades. Um, so this question of the narrative construction of loss and uh, the question of the affectivity of loss, and the question, of course, of temporality and this, uh, this idea of reproduction and forgetting and re-application of the past and so on. So, um, on a very basic level, of course, temporality is uh, is a dimension of loss, and maybe with uh, the work of Chakrabarti, we can think that into a, not, into a new direction. I shall have to read that. Thank you. So, thank you, everyone. It's been a very um, profitable discussion. Um, thank you, Andreas. For yeah. Thank you. Lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thanks all. <laughs>